right, um, we are in John chapter 15 this morning. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, if you've got your Bibles, and I would like to pray for us as we continue with our, our service this morning. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence, in your space, and to hear from you. And Lord, that is my prayer this morning, that we would hear from you, that you would speak to us, God. Speak through this section of scripture, speak through the words of Jesus. Remind us of who we are who you have created us to be, and of the life that you have called us into, God. Be with us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are in a series in the Gospel of John, uh, looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus. There are seven of them throughout the Gospel of John, where Jesus will make a statement. He will say, I am, and then fill it in with something, a a picture, a self-declaration of who he is. But it's not just a way of Jesus answering the question, who am I? It is that. It is him revealing himself to his disciples and the people around him, but it is also a way for him of identifying himself with God the Father. This is something that Pastor Brandon talked about in the first week that we were doing this series. That statement, I am, comes out of the Old Testament in the story of Moses at the burning bush. Some of you may have heard this story before, but he's talking with God, and one of the questions he asks God is, what's your name? What shall I call you? And God just gives him the answer, I am. And that, for the Jewish people, became this statement about the nature of God and who he was, the the self-existent one, the self-sustaining one, the I am. So when Jesus uses these statements, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or this week, I am the true vine, he intends to connect himself to God. He intends to draw an association there. He wants his disciples seeing and knowing the connection that he has with God. And in fact, these last few chapters in John, as Pastor Brandon talked about last week, the message of Jesus is very strongly about the unity between he and the Father, the connectedness that he has with his Father in heaven, with God. And this week, With this section, he's going to expand that picture. He's going to give us a metaphor, a parable, and he's going to start drawing his disciples into that picture, into that unity with him. He's going to start saying, the connection that I have with God, I want to extend it to you. I want to share it with you. So let's start looking at the passage of Scripture this morning. We're going to go verse by verse through this. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, starting in verse 1. Jesus opens in the first eight verses with sort of this metaphor, this word picture, this parable. So let's start looking at it together. Verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower, or in some translations, the gardener. He's talking about grapes, okay? That's the basis of our picture here, the basis of our parable. He's using a grapevine as a metaphor for himself, and he's drawing God the Father into it, and he's going to start drawing the disciples into it as well. And this isn't the first time in Scripture that we've seen God use uh, a grapevine as a metaphor for somebody or a group of people. In fact, throughout the course of the Old Testament, it's fairly common for God to use the metaphor of a grapevine as a picture of his people, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. We see it happen on a number of occasions. And it's interesting because in the Old Testament, we know that the the picture of grapes or the wine that you make from grapes are pictures of God's blessing upon people. They're, they're, They're meant to symbolize a good thing. And so we can see this kind of through line where God, in using this picture of his people of Israel, he wanted them to be a blessing to the world around them. Those pictures are pictures of how God grew this grapevine up so that he could care for the world around him. And I'm reminded of God's promise to Abraham way back in the book of Genesis in the beginning. Some of you may have read the story of Abraham before. He's the father of the Jewish people. And God came to him and he said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have lots and lots of descendants, so many that no one can count them all. And through your descendants, through the people coming after you, I am going to bless the entire world. You are going to be a blessing to everyone. And so this picture of a grapevine fits into this promise that God has given, this calling that he has on the people of Israel to be a blessing to the entire world, to be part of this picture that he has for them. And so Jesus steps into that space, and now he says, I am the grapevine. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. And this is not him 
like removing Israel from the picture or somehow kicking the Jewish people out of the metaphor. This is him stepping in as the fulfillment of that original promise. So if you've got the notes this morning, there's a number of fill-ins in the notes today that, I'll, that we'll go through. But the first one is just that. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel's calling. Jesus is the completion, the fruition of that promise that God gave to Abraham and that promise that he's been trying to work out through the lives of his people. It is all coming together in the person of Jesus. And he now is the vehicle through whom God is going to deliver that blessing to the entire world. And part of the story of this week in the life of Jesus is that it's not just limited to the Jewish people now. He is inviting all of his disciples into that space with him. He is inviting all of his disciples to be part of that grapevine, to be part of that process of blessing the world. And in fact, the the disciples after this time, as they leave the boundaries of Israel and start sharing the gospel with the rest of the world, they're going to use some of this same terminology and some of this same language as they start to share the good message of Jesus with people around them. Paul, in the later chapters of Romans, writing to them, says, you have been grafted in. You are a branch that has been added to the plant because God wants to deliver his blessing through you. Paul, to be fair, Paul is talking about an olive tree at that point. That's because he was writing to a Roman audience, though, and olive trees made more sense to them than, than grape trees did, okay? But it's the same metaphor. It's the same idea. God is growing a plant, and through that plant, he wants to bless the entire world. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel's calling to be a blessing to the whole earth. And now he's calling, is inviting his disciples into that calling. And Jesus is the true vine, as opposed to anything else that claims to be a vine or a source of life. How many of you know that our world is filled with lots of voices claiming to teach you how to live life to the full, right? Anybody been on YouTube recently? There are lots of folks on there with some exercise routine or some meditation routine or whatever. And all that stuff is great. That's not me knocking those things, okay? Uh, some of that stuff is really, really exciting. I have a particular neuroscientist on YouTube that I really enjoy listening to because I find a, a lot of benefit from what he talks about. His name is Andrew Huberman. Anybody else Andrew Huberman fans here? Just me? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> So um, you're all going to go look him up now and you're going to think I'm a weirdo and that's fine. But the end result, right, is no matter how many good voices are out there, no number of good or, or, or whatever voices can take the place of what the role and the position that Jesus has. He is the true vine. Through him is the way to experience the kind of life that God designed for us. He is the way to be connected to the work that God is doing that. Jesus alone can claim that. He is the true source of all healthy growth and of all good fruit. He is the way to the good life. And God, his father, is the vine dresser or the gardener. He owns the vineyard and all that is in it, and he is the one who cares for the growth that happens there. He has the wisdom and the ability to help fruit come forth. And so we continue in verse 2, and Jesus says this, He, my Father, removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it more, to bear more fruit, to make it more fruitful. We're going to come back to this idea of God removing branches, so put a pin in that for, this morning, for a moment, because I know that as soon as we read that line, some of you guys start getting a little bit of anxiety and kind of breathing quickly, so just hang on to it, okay? We're going to come back to that idea, and we'll talk about that. But I want to focus on that second part where it says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. This is a gardening metaphor, and it's one that I think is familiar to most of us. I am not a gardener. I love to eat the things that come from the garden and to appreciate and enjoy them. I do not like being the person who makes them grow or plants them or tends them. So gardening metaphors are lost on me a little bit. But I do know that a healthy plant needs to be pruned, right? There's a part of my brain that is like, if it grew vegetables or fruit once, that means everything was working right, right? So if I just leave it alone, it should keep working right, right? No, that's not how it works, right? (laughs) If if it bears fruit, okay, and then you leave it alone, it's not going to bear fruit next season. In fact, it's probably not even going to survive to next season, okay? I was reading about grapevines uh, preparing for this because I don't know anything about, I know how to eat grapes, okay, but I don't know how to grow grapevines And I was reading, and one of the things that I noted was the recommendation is that when you prune a grapevine, you're supposed to remove like 90% of the wood growth from the previous year. 90%! That seems like a lot! 
okay, that seems like a really aggressive, reckless form of pruning, but that's what the, that's what the, the grapevine needs. That's how it grows best. That's how it grows healthiest. And I just don't understand grapes very well, okay? So when I look at it, I'm like, oh my goodness, that seems like getting a little wild with the pruning shears, but it's because God knows exactly what he's doing. And when we talk about God as the gardener, as the vine dresser, we're talking about something very, very similar. We're talking about living a life in the Lord where we can expect to be pruned. I don't know if you came to church to be made, like, feel good or whatever this morning. I apologize if you walked in because now expect to be pruned. That's what I'm saying, right? (laughs) Expect that God is coming along with the pruning shoes because the truth is, that for a plant to be healthy, the, the dead or dying or withered parts need to be removed. They need to be clipped away. And in fact, I was reading about it. It's the opposite end of the spectrum has to be pruned too. The parts that are overgrown have to be clipped and they have to be removed as well if the plant is going to be healthy. And the gardener is the one who knows best how to do that, how to care for the plant, how to bring it to health. I was reading a, a quote. Some of you might be familiar with N.T. Wright. He's a scholar from England, and, and I'm a big fan of his. But he, in talking about this passage of Scripture, he said this, The vine dresser is never closer to the vine, taking more thought over its long-term health and productivity than when he has the knife in his hand. This idea that God, as the gardener, he is most invested in who we are, most invested in our long-term growth and health and in our life than when he has the pruning shears in his hand. He is intimately close to who we are. It is a sign of him, from him, of love and of care and of his investedness in our lives. We can expect that God is going to be deeply involved in the process of pruning who we are and helping us grow toward health. And then Jesus continues in verse 3. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. And this is a call back to something that he said to the disciples a few chapters ago. Some of you may have read, but after he washes their feet, he has this conversation with Peter where he says, you've been made clean by the word that I've spoken to you. And the word clean that he uses here is related in Greek. It's a play on words. The, the Greek word for prune and the Greek word for cleanse both come from the same root word together. They, they, they're connected to each other. So Jesus is telling the disciples, you've already been cleansed. That work has been done by the word that I spoke to you, but God is still doing the pruning, but he and I are involved in the same process together. We're on the same team. We're involved in the same work. We're doing this together, but the pruning process still needs to happen. God and Jesus play different roles in the process, but they, he is connecting himself to the work of the Father united in the same work. So I want to ask you a question question this morning, and heads up, this is a trick question, okay? Got that? So slow down as you answer this, and if you get it wrong, don't feel bad about yourself, because I'm trying to trick you a little bit, so I apologize. But what's the job of the branch? In this metaphor, he's talking about branches, what's the job of the branch? What's the branch supposed to do? There were a couple of different answers, but I heard the one I was looking for, okay? You would think that the job of the branch is to bear fruit, right? And certainly that's supposed to be part of the process, but the job of the branch is not to bear fruit, I would argue. The job of the branch is to do exactly what Jesus talks about next in verse 4. The job of the branch is to abide, And this is the next note in our fill-in this morning. The job of the branch is to abide. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus says this, Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Now, that word abide is an interesting word. It's not one that we use often in modern English. And in fact, in modern English, I looked at the definition of it before, before this weekend. And the definition that we have of the word abide is somewhat different than what it was back then when Jesus, he used the Greek word that we translate into English. But even in English, the, the word abide has gone through a transition over the course of its usage. Now, the word abide means to agree with or to tolerate something, okay? Okay. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind when he used the word abide here in this. He wasn't saying just agree with the vine or tolerate the vine, okay? 
Now, I'll admit, sometimes in my Christianity, I fall into a place where I just feel like I'm trying to agree with Jesus or just to abide or to, to tolerate Jesus. But that's not really what I think he's getting at here. And I would never claim that those moments describe the best of my spiritual growth and relationship with the Lord, okay? But the word used to mean, once upon a time, to live in, to dwell in, to wait in in a place, to be present in a place, to not leave somewhere. The word abide meant to stay, to be invested in something, to be connected to a place. I like that idea of to be present because I'm reminded honestly of the opposite. How many of you guys have ever had a conversation with somebody and partway through the conversation you realize, oh, this person is not listening anymore. They, they've checked out, they are somewhere else in this moment. That I do that to my wife sometimes, can I just admit, like the husband's blunder here this morning, that partway through a conversation, I am still like listening with 10% of one ear, but my brain is really thinking about something totally different. And she'll stop, this is just me, right? Nobody else does this, okay? And she'll stop me and she'll be like, where are you right now? You just left. And I'm like, no, I'm right here. I'm still sitting here, I haven't moved. And she's like, no way, you're thinking about something else, right? What Jesus is talking about is the opposite of that. He's talking about that kind of presentness, that, that lived in, connected kind of abiding that he means in this picture. The branch needs to abide in him. It cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And so we end up with this metaphor that on the surface is incredibly simple. Because everybody knows that, even I know, that if you cut a branch off of the tree and throw it on the ground, it's not going to grow anything, right? It's not going to stay alive. It's not going to keep producing fruit. I know very little about plants, but I know that much, that if you want it to keep on growing, you've got to keep it connected to the vine. And it's easy to see that part of the metaphor, but I find that it's much more difficult to then take that and translate it into my own life. When I take it and I say, okay, so what does it look like for me to abide in the vine? What does it look like for me to stay connected to Jesus, to experience the kind of life that he offers, to experience the kind of fruitfulness that comes through a branch that is living in him and abiding in him? I find that it's difficult to sort of live that out in my life. If you had to guess this morning, what kinds of things would you assume qualify as abiding in ways that might keep a person connected to the life that Jesus offers? This is not a trick question, okay? Go ahead and just shout them out to me this morning. How do you understand abiding? What does that look like in your opinion? Be still and know that I am God. That's a good one. What else? Read the word. Read the word, absolutely. Pray. Pray? This is a quiet group this morning, <laughs> okay? I said this is not a trick question. Just shout stuff out at me, okay? We've got three good ones so far. Anything else? Share the word. I like that one. Meditate. Meditate. Sure. Okay, these are all good answers. You guys seem to be running out of gas, so I'm going to take back over, okay? <laughs> these, are all, these are all good answers, and we could keep that list going if we wanted to. We could talk about fasting. We could talk about tithing. We could talk about giving. We could talk about prayer and worship and being in the word. We could talk about all of the ways that we normally understand. All of those things qualify as abiding in Jesus. Those are the things that he's talking about. But there's a difference between it's easy for me to make that list and to know what abiding looks like, but for whatever reason, it's very hard for me to take that list and then put it into practice in my own life. Right? Anybody else? Okay? For whatever reason, I know what abiding looks like, but it's difficult for me to take it and start living it out. How many of us, don't raise your hand for this one, but how many of you this morning feel like a branch that is strong and super connected to the vine and is bearing much fruit? Hopefully a few of us, but I'm guessing not everyone. In fact, I'm willing to bet that some of you feel much more like the next verse as Jesus continues in verse 6. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Again, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I know that there are a few of us here today who feel more like this. We feel disconnected, detached. We don't feel like the life of the Lord is anywhere near us, and we certainly don't feel like there's any fruit growing on us. And at that point, there's sort of a dangerous kind of tipping balance that we can find ourselves in, isn't there? Because it is all too easy to read that last verse and then come to the conclusion that I am a withered vine and the only thing left for me is to be thrown into the fire. It's easy for me to assume that I'm not connected at all, 
that I'm lying on the ground sort of looking up at the bush or looking up at the vine going, ugh, it would be so much work to get reconnected back there. It's not possible. And if that's you this morning, I want to say something to you. When God looks at you, what do you think he sees? When God looks at you, do you think he sees a dead branch lying on the ground that is only fit to be thrown into the fire? Because I think the answer is no. I don't think that's what he sees in me or in you. I think God sees much more. And the reason I think that is because the Bible is filled with story after story after story of people who thought exactly that, that they were dead, withered branches until God came along and said, no, come on, you just need to eat something. You need some water. You need to get connected to the vine. You need to receive some life. I'm reminded of the story of Elijah. Some of you may have read this before, but in the Old Testament, there was a prophet named Elijah who did some powerful things led by the Lord. But there's this one scene afterward where an evil queen has it out for him and she wants to kill him. And so he runs for his life and he goes into the wilderness and he's exhausted. He's at the end of himself. He's totally washed out and he's lying on the ground underneath this bush and he's just crying out to God saying, God, it would be better for me to die. Why did you keep me alive this long? I am a withered branch. I am laying on the ground to just cut me off and throw me in the fire. And God sends an angel and just says, no, son, you just need to eat something. Have some food. Take a nap. You're going to feel better afterward, I promise. And that's exactly what Elijah does. And God is coming along and he's saying the same thing to us today. You are not as dead as you think you are. You are not as dead as you think you are. I still see something in you. I want you part of what I'm doing. I have life for you. We've been singing a new song the last few weeks called My Testimony. And it has this line in the bridge, if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. And that is true this morning. We are still here today. We are in this place, and so God is not done with us. We are not as dead as we might think we are. You just need to eat something. You need a little pruning. You need some sunshine. You need some water. I know we're talking about plants and grapevines, but that's actually decent advice for anybody, okay? Because even though the goal of the process might be to grow fruit, the job of the branch is to abide. The job of the branch is to stay connected to the vine, and the growing of the fruit will start to take care of itself. And so Jesus continues in verses 7 and 8 this morning. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. You want to be connected to the vine? You want to experience the life that Jesus offers? Do you want to abide in a way that causes you to bear much fruit to the Father's glory? Then ask him for it. Pray and ask him to do these things for you. Church, this isn't permission to pray for Ferraris in Jesus' name, okay? I'm not telling you not to pray for Ferraris, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's been having this conversation about connectedness to God, about unity with the Father, about his oneness, and now this picture of the vine where he's drawing the disciples in and he's talking about them being connected as well. He hasn't changed topics all of a sudden. He's still talking about the same thing. He's saying, if this is something you want, if you want to be connected to the life of the Lord and what he's doing, if you want to be able to bear fruit, the kind of fruit that he wants to grow, ask him for it. He's not going to say no to that. He's not going to turn people away who want to be connected to him and part of what he's doing. Do you feel dead? Do you feel like a branch that's been cut off and cast to the ground? then ask God to pick you up and to restore you. No branch lives apart from being connected to the vine, and no human truly lives apart from the life that Jesus offers in himself. Ask him for that and know that he's going to deliver. And that leads us to the next, the next point in our fill-in-blank this morning in the notes. Fruit comes from vital unity with Jesus. Fruit comes from vital unity with Jesus. That connection has to be there first. We have to be in him, learning how to abide in him, receiving from him, and then fruit grows afterward. Because the branch's job isn't to grow fruit, it's to abide in the vine. And that fruit doesn't grow by effort. I don't walk around seeing plants just like red in the face, white knuckling it through, trying to grow fruit. The fruit grows when the plant has everything that it needs, right? And then it just happens. And ideally, I think fruit should be the same for us. I don't want for it to have to be this huge effort. I want for it to grow because we have everything we need. 
It's the vital life-giving connection to Jesus that causes us to grow the way that God designed us to. So we need to focus on the abiding in him. And this is where Jesus shifts gears a little bit. In 9 through 17, he's going to start giving a bit of a a breakdown and an explanation of the verses, as we've been doing so far. So I'm going to move through these next ones a little quick because I don't want to reiterate too much. But 9 and 10, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And we're told that abiding in Christ involves love and obedience. This is the next point in our notes this morning. Abiding in Christ involves both love and obedience. Throughout Scripture, we see this two-part theme show up when we're talking about spiritual growth and life with God. Different words are sometimes used. We'll call it belief and action or faith and works or whatever it is. But here Jesus talks about love and obedience. The idea is that there is a being that leads into doing a way of existence, a way of being the people that God has created us to be that leads us toward doing the things he's designed us to do. And the truth is sometimes we can get that backward. We get the cart before the horse and, and we think that it is the things that we do that define who we are. It's easy to fall into this place of thinking, I have to perform a certain way. I have to bear certain fruit first and then that will make me the person that God designed me to be. But the truth is, that's not the pattern that I see from Scripture. The pattern that I see from Scripture starts in Genesis chapter 1 when God creates Adam and Eve. And he says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Male and female, he created them. Patterned after God himself, designed in his image. And then God said, what about man and woman? He said, it is very good. And yes, in the same verses, he does give them a job. He talks about what they're going to do and and how life is going to go for them. But that comes after he has created them to be something. And that pattern holds through the rest of Scripture. That God wants to speak to us about who we are, who he's created us to be. He wants us to experience his love first and then to learn obedience from that place. And so we sort of get left with two questions in the aftermath. And the first one is this, do you know that God loves you? I mean, I realize that's a Sunday school question on some level, and I don't care. It never stops being important. Do you know that God loves you? Because, beloved, I've got to tell you, if that question's not settled, obedience is going to be hard. Living out of that space and loving the people around us and doing what God has asked is going to be hard. I remember a really, um, a really, well, memorable moment in my life. I was back in college, and, uh, and I was driving along Highway 126 toward Eugene. I don't remember if I was going to class or work or wherever, but it was one of those seasons. I was a Bible college student, and I hadn't read my Bible for months, except for doing, like, assignments in class, but that doesn't count, right? Okay? I hadn't prayed for months. I hadn't read my Bible for months, and I was feeling pretty low about myself and my Christianity. I thought, here I am learning how to be a leader in the church. I'm a Bible college student, and I just felt like a terrible Christian at the time. And I thought, while I was driving in the car, I thought, I should pray right now. I should talk to God and just see what he wants to say. And I thought, I don't want to do that, because he's either going to tell me what a terrible Christian I am, or he's going to come at me with a list of things that I need to fix. Anybody ever been in that boat before? Like, I don't want to pray right now because he's either going to tell me how junky I am or he's going to give me a list of things I need to do. That was me wrestling with that doing before being. But I did it. I don't remember how I got over the hump in the moment, but I remember praying in the car and I remember hearing from God so strongly because all I said was, God, I don't know what you want to say, but here I am. And I heard two things. He said, I'm so glad that you're here and I want you to know how much I love you. And for the rest of my drive, like the next five, ten minutes, he just repeated that over and over and over and over and over again. He didn't say anything about how long it had been since I prayed. He didn't tell me to do anything. He just said, I'm so glad you're here, and I want you to know that I love you. Folks, that's always step one in him, is knowing his love for us. And it's only out of that place that we learn how to obey and how to move And it doesn't work if we tip one way or the other. If I lean completely into obedience and forget the love piece, 
then there's this joyless sort of drudgery that settles into my life as a Christian. And if I swing the other direction to only experiencing the love of God and never, never sharing it, never serving and loving the people around me, then I get stuck in this ingrown sort of, you know, immobile place. And neither of those is healthy. We need to learn how to engage this one, two kind of back and forth with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus continues in verse 11, just in case we were worried about the joylessness of Christianity. He says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Because the truth is that in him, in the true vine, is the only place that real joy is offered. How many of you guys have discovered it's tough to be happy in life sometimes? Anybody run into that before? Okay. Okay. But the promise of Jesus is that joy is found in him. As we learn to abide in him, as we learn to engage him. And if I think back to the moments in my life, I can see the truth of that echoed in particular moments. When I, at the moments in my life, when I have felt most loved, most filled, and when I have been most in love with someone else, are the moments when obedience has been so easy And loving and serving the people around me has been so easy and so filled with joy. I think about my relationship with my wife, right? In that initial season of just being in love and being married, it was so easy to serve her and to love her and to care for her and just, what do you need? What what can I get for you? What can I do for you? And all of it came, and of course, it gets a little harder over the years, right? Because feelings change and the dynamic of the relationship changes and the way that I feel changes. And it's, it's not worse, it's just different. Okay, but sometimes that sense of being so in love that the serving is easy, sometimes that changes and it transforms a little bit. The same thing happens with my kids. I remember standing in the hospital, holding each of my children and just looking at this little baby and thinking, I would do anything for this baby, right? I would do anything that it took. And then just a few short years later, I'm like, get this thing away from me. I cannot handle... The interaction that's going on right now. I'm the only parent who ever said that, right? Okay. But in those moments where I am most loved and where I am most in loved and the love in me is full, the obedience becomes easy all of a sudden. And it is filled with joy. And folks, I got to tell you, that for me is the place that I want to live my Christianity out of. If I can, if I can do that, that's where I want to live my life out of. I want my obedience to come like that. There is great joy in the kind of love that moves to serve. And then Jesus continues in 12, 13, and 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And Jesus starts talking about what it looks like to love to care for the people around us. When he was asked, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment in all of scripture? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are summed up in these two things. Folks, he's still on the same soapbox. He never got off. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he reminds them that the greatest love is the one that lays down its life for its friends. And yes, he's talking about his own death because he's just hours away from laying down his own life. But he's also speaking about the way that he has lived before this. Because how many of you guys have discovered sometimes it's easy to say, I would die for so-and-so, but it's much harder to take the trash out for them. <laughs> right? Some, not all the time, but sometimes. Sometimes. It's easy to say I would die for this person, but it's harder for me to lay my life down on a daily basis and to serve them and love them in the moments of my life. And Jesus is talking about both here. He's talking about both. He didn't just die for his friends. He laid his life down to love them every single day. He lived as a servant to the people around him. Paul says it in Philippians, considering their needs above his own. Jesus did both, and he had both in mind here when he was instructing his disciples. And so the next point in our notes is that Jesus' example is one of self-sacrifice. His example in love is one of self-sacrifice. And then he continues in verse 15. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. Jesus shared with his disciples. He brought them into his process. They knew his thoughts. They knew what was going on inside. Have you guys ever had a friendship or a relationship that was close enough where you guys brought 
each other into your decision-making process. And you said like, hey, think through this with me. Here's what's going on for me. Here's what I'm processing. Here's what I'm doing. Help me figure this out. And then kind of made a decision out of that space. I've had relationships like that a few times in my life. And I got to tell you, there's something precious about it. There's something beautiful and amazing. And that's exactly what Jesus has in mind here as he says this. I no longer call you slaves. I no longer call you servants because I've brought you into my process. I've made the Father's thoughts known to you. I've brought you into this. And Paul will even continue this later in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, you have the mind of Christ. God has opened his thoughts to you. He has brought you into his process. And so the next point in our notes says, we have become friends through revelation. We've become friends through revelation because God has opened himself to us. He has revealed himself and he has brought us into this space of being his friends. And then Jesus continues in 16 and 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Again, this reminder, you are not as dead as you think you are. He chose you. He picked you. He said, these are the ones that I want. I want them to be connected to the work that I'm doing. I want them to be part of the grapevine that I am growing. Through them, I want to bless the world. So as we finish this morning, there are sort of three things in this last section, responding to the call to abide. The first one is this. Pray for the kind of unity with Jesus that he has with God the Father. This is answering that question, do you know that God loves you? Pray to experience his love. Pray to be close to him. I shared that story about my college experience earlier where I heard him say, I'm so glad that you're here. I just want you to know that I love you. It's 20 years later, 20 and change, some odd years later. And I still remember that moment so clearly. There was something about that experience that was so meaningful. I am still drawing life from it now. Those are experiences that we should be having all the time. That's a conversation that we should be engaging in God with as often as we possibly can. Do you know that God loves you? Abiding starts with this and cannot translate into healthy obedience without that step. The second thing, pray that God will reveal his will and empower you to be obedient to it. Pray that God will reveal his will and empower you to be obedient to it. And that's the question. How is God's love moving us toward obedience? Love has to be demonstrated. It has to be lived out. It has to be given freely in order to be love. And it is best given through serving the object of our love. Again, have you ever noticed how much easier it is to serve someone when you are really settled in the love that you have for them and the love that they have for you? Because there can be so much joy in those moments. Do you want to bear fruit the way God intended you to? Then ask him to prune you. Invite him to be involved in your growth and your health. Invite him into the process. And then the last thing this morning, pray that you will learn to love the way that God loves. How many of you guys have discovered that people disagree on what it means to be a loving person? Anybody noticed that before? Some people insist that love is just kindness and nothing more, always being nice to people. Other people insist that love is always speaking the truth no matter how harsh it is and how hurtful it may be. And other people insist that love is somewhere in between. The truth is this. Jesus' instruction to us in this section was to love each other as he has loved us. Because godly love flows out of being loved by him. Do you want to learn how to love the way God loves? It's something that we can only learn by example. And the truth is that if we don't have an example to learn from, then we won't learn it well. We'll be left to sort of figure it out for ourselves, and that doesn't go very well. God is the author of love. He knows it best. We have to learn it from him, and I think learning it from him really comes from three places. First, we have the example of Jesus in Scripture. We can look at the life of Jesus in Scripture to see how he loved his disciples and the people around him, and we can learn from what he did. Second, we can experience God's love for us personally through times of worship and prayer, like that moment that I had driving on the freeway, hearing from God. But those moments of having God speak to us and abiding in those moments where he tells us who we are. And then finally, we can receive godly love from other people in our lives. As they are loving us, we can see their example. 
And ideally, we want to be engaged in all three. We want to be engaged in as many of those as we possibly can be because our world desperately needs the love of God. Amen? And it's only going to happen as we start to see it and as we start to live it out the way that God... End of service. There it is right there. You know. <laughs> Perfect time for the alarm. Good job. So I apologize. I'm not, I don't mean to embarrass whoever's phone that is. That's not what I was going for. Just funny. So, um, yeah, ideally we want to be engaged in all three. Learn how to love, learn how to abide, learn how to receive what God has for us. Amen. Let's pray as we finish this morning. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be here in your space, to hear from you, to receive from you. God, I pray that you would continue to speak to us. Let us receive what you have. Bring us into that picture. Make us part of the vine that you are growing, the life of Jesus that you have to offer. And yes, through us bear fruit. All of the good things that you want to do, whether it's the fruit of the Spirit or bringing people to Jesus or growing the kingdom, whatever it is, God, grow fruit through us. But not because we are doing it by sheer effort, God. Let it happen because we are learning how to be people who abide in you, who receive your love, who live in your love, and who step out of that place in obedience, God. Speak to us this morning. Let us receive everything you have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yep, 39 minutes. Same length of time that I do almost every time I step up here to speak. There you go. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Don't forget, uh, life group signups are out in the Connect Hub. And, oh, this is Palm Sunday, by the way. I'm wearing my palm tree shirt. And next week, next week is Easter. Yay! So... Be here for Easter. We'll see you guys all very soon. Have a great day.